Hi, I am Dr. Carla Gall. I am the coordinator of Indiana Children Nature Network, and we're very happy to have um, Dr. Christina Gonzalez with us, um, sharing about the benefits of nature and getting outside. Um, just as we get started, I am going to go ahead and share just a little bit about um, the coordinator of Indiana Children Nature Network, and we're very happy to have um, Dr. Christina Gonzalez with us, um, sharing about the benefits of nature and getting outside. Um, just as we get started, I am going to go ahead and share just a little bit about, about Indiana Children Nature Network. So, um, We've just had uh, Nature Play Days a couple of months ago in June. Um, we have our dates here for um, 2024. So that will be June 1st through 9th. Um, we are part of the Environmental Educators Association of Indiana. And we really try to have as many state specific resources as we can. Um, and saying that, we do have uh, Christina um, from Florida <laughs> joining us today. And we're, we're glad that she's virtually able to uh, spend some time with us as part of that. Uh, as far as the mission of ICANN, we're really just trying to connect uh, children, families, and communities uh, with the natural environment, recognizing all the benefits with it and building that lifelong uh, love of nature. Uh, and while we do focus on children and families, it in by no means is exclusive to that. So educators, communities, and people in general. Um, so we raise awareness of the benefits. We um, promote those unstructured playtime uh, and time outdoors. And I would say that goes for us as adults, we need that as well. And then also just kind of building those networks um, amongst people and such uh, throughout the state and other places as well. Uh, one initiative that we have is I Can Play 30. Uh, we encourage people to take a pledge to play outside at least 30 minutes every day. And with that, uh, we share seasonal ideas, networking with others. Um, we have a hashtag, I Can Play 30. And with that, we've been doing quarterly um, book chats. Um, so we have a different book. We're reading um, Vitamin N uh, for Nature by Richard Louvre uh, for this next time. I think that's going to be in September. And then we'll have a discussion on fall ideas for um, getting some outdoor time as well. And so that's virtual as well. And we'd love to have you join us. And these are some additional ideas of getting outside in summer and uh, all kinds of ideas. But we are actually here to listen to Dr. Gonzalez. I'm going to go ahead and pin her so that we can see her much better, nice and big, and then uh, let her go ahead and uh, share her screen. Uh, I've known Dr. Gonzalez for a long time. Um, she's my sister, uh, but happens to be a master naturalist from Florida, certified in Florida and Virginia, both places. And on certifications in ecotherapy and um, all kinds of other things. Um, she loves to learn and then apply that in different ways. Uh, and then she's also a certified mental health counselor as well. Um, she may give us some uh, background information, um, but I know that she's well qualified and uh, a, a great person to share with us on this, uh, this topic. She has chosen where she lives. Um, very specifically for the nature around and uh, just hearing of all the things um, that she has just outside her window um, is fantastic. So we'll turn it over to uh, Christina. Thank you, Carla or Dr. Go, however you wish to be called tonight. I am going to share this, the, the actual right for presentation. And I really wanted to talk about, like I said, the benefits of getting out in nature. And one of the cool things that I wanted to say before we even start is that any of the things that we talk about of the benefits of being out in nature, you can also get by bringing it into your house and bringing it into you. And so that's one of the coolest things that I really enjoy about nature. So just in general, nature can affect our mental health in particular in a lot of ways. Um, you know, from your mood, um, it can boost depression, um, make it so that you don't feel as depressed, help you decrease your anxiety. It's great for increasing focus and attentiveness. Um, one of the words I love is the word fascination. So it increases fascination and it actually helps us rely less on focus attention. Um, 
some of the, the special specializations I have um, in my clinical practice as a mental health counselor are actually in ADHD and anxiety. And so I use nature a lot in my treatment of those two things in particular, because I find that nature is fascinating and really helpful for people trying to learn how to calm down their anxiety response and increase their ability to control their focus. Um, we also have a lot of social and emotional types of effects from um, nature, including uh, new connections, being more active, having more peer support. I frequently will have clients who've been really isolated, and especially since the pandemic, we're seeing kids, adults who haven't been out in a long time, and they're just really struggling to make social connections. And so many of them tell me, you know, they'll start out because I tell everybody, I want you to go for a walk every day. And one of the things they do is they'll start telling me about what they discover on their walks and the people they meet and all of those things. So anyway, nature is win, 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 win when it comes to your mental health. Here's just a couple of facts. By the way, most of these pictures are from places that I've been. A lot of them are in Florida since I live down here. This particular picture is from Fort Myers Beach, which unfortunately got devastated in this last Hurricane Ian. Um, but one of the most important things um, I found with the research that I'm sharing is it just gives you a little bit of an overview. If you, if any of you really want like major research, you can email me and I'd be glad to give you more information. Um, but one of the first things that, that we wanna talk about is walking, nature walking. Um, one study found that, that nature walks of 90 minutes was found to really lower the activity here, which we use for ruminating. So if you think about like those times you're like, oh my gosh, I have to pay the bills and oh my gosh, my kids won't be quiet. Oh my goodness, I can't do this, I can't do this. That's the ruminating. And what we find is typically people who are going on walks regularly will decrease those negative thoughts and it breaks up those cycles of ruminating thinking. Um, in fact, they've done some studies that a 30 minute walk four to five times a day outside can actually be as effective as Prozac in some mild to moderate cases of depression. And um, that's really exciting news. That does not mean that we all need to, to stop our medication or avoid medication, because sometimes that's really important. But nature can be one of the best supplements that we can take. I, oh, I did mention something. The, the levels of the stress hormone cortisol, you know, that's what happens when we are in fight or flight. And since the pandemic, most of the people that I know anyway, personally and professionally, have found that we get into that fight or flight response much more often. And that in increases our blood pressure. It makes us more reactive to people. It makes us really struggle to be able to handle um, all of the different things that, um, that come our way. And it oftentimes makes it so that we're just thinking and thinking about everything that's wrong. And so they found that not only being outside in nature, but even hearing the sounds of nature can lower our blood pressure and the levels of stress hormone cortisol. And the cool thing about um, the cool thing about that is that we um, you can also do that in your house. So they found that similarly, sounds of nature and the sounds of like bugs or water or rain can really help relax us. So nature, again, is a win-win, whether you're walking or even just sitting outside. I'm going to give you just a couple more research things. I don't really mean to, this to be um, a whole too much research. Uh, another thing is, is that spending time in nature is one of the most effective ways to reduce your everyday stress and mental fatigue. And I, I, I put that one in there because for a living, every day I talk to people all about the problems in their lives, whether it's a kid who can't stand their parents, whether it's a parent who's struggling with their parents, whether it's someone who's really struggling with their work situation. And sometimes I deal with some really significant trauma. And for me to be able to show up every hour and say, hey, how are you doing? And be that therapist that my clients need, I need to be able to um, be present. And so 
you can't see it, but behind this laptop, I have a bunch of passion flower plants out here, which I love passion flower, by the way, they have the most beautiful flowers. Plus their leaves and, and flowers are actually great um, for anxiety. So every now and then I just nibble on a leaf as well. But they're a butterfly pollinators. And uh, I mean, the butterfly attractants. And so the pollinators love going over there. I have a bird bath and a bird feeder. So I get to see birds and my clients get into it. It is so cute because they will be, um, okay, Dr. Gonzalez, what birds and butterflies do you see? And they're always looking for signs like, oh, there's a cardinal, what does that mean? But for me, seeing it through my windows and then going outside and being around my plants and walking around my yard, I've got a lot of fruit trees and a lot of things, um, really helps me be able to relax. And that gives me the ability to discharge all of that stress and mental fatigue. Honestly, for I think for most of us who are either working with kids, working with adults, or we're parents, we're caregivers, being able to just even sit outside for about five to 10 minutes is one of the best things we can do. Walking barefoot is also really important. And you know, a couple of people on this webinar know my older son, Alex, and he was known for being no shoes, Alex. And you know, one of the cool things about it is that it regulates our nervous system and it really helps us to ground ourselves, right? So um, again, you know, uh, nature can help us, us increase our memory span and it can really decrease anxiety, depression, and it can really reduce adrenaline and noradrenaline. And that's those, those fight or flight hormones that we have. Uh, let me see that there's some chat things. Nibble on the leaf. I love having my desk situated to look out of a window. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that one. Um, it makes such a big difference. So um, by the way, those pretty pink flowers that you see in this picture, um, that's actually was on my property up until Hurricane Ian this last year. And um, it's a uh, silk floss tree. It has big spikes on it, but I have a couple of its babies, but that was one of the things that I make sure I have lots of flowers I can see out my window. And that just really makes me feel happy. So there's a lot of ways to connect in nature. And I put a few of them here and I'm sure all of you could give me even more. But you know, one of the things I really wanna say, you know, we connect with nature and we can get those mental health and physical health benefits, not just when we're outside, which is wonderful and having that great unstructured time, but even when we bring nature inside. And so, you know, whether we've got, um, you know, like a, a shell, um, I've got my ammonite. I've got a lot of nature around me, actually. Um, but just having nature, nature um, products around us can really kind of give us that sense of uh, the connection with nature. And one thing I often have my clients do, especially the kids, is I'll have them as a homework assignment, go find a piece of nature that they can bring with them to every therapy session. And so we do a little bit of show and tell and they talk to me about it. And I'll ask them, you know, and so it talked to me about how this piece of nature inspires you or what it makes you feel like. And it's really great because they can bring it into our therapy sessions, even if we're doing it via video, right, but like this. Another thing that's really important is, um, you know, connecting with our food. Most of us are eating, are, are eating food on a regular basis, and hopefully some of our our food either was a plant, is a plant, or ate plants, right? And so really being able to connect with our food can make us feel really um, connected with nature as well. Um, one of the things I find um, for both for mental health, but also for my health too, is you know growing herbs, growing vegetables. I find kids in particular love doing that. Uh, my son, Danny, uh, who's on this call right now, he doesn't necessarily love watering my plants. Um, and he gets to do it a lot because I had back surgery a couple months ago. And so he gets to do some of that for me. But when we find little plants that we can eat, he gets so excited because he loves to cook. And so really being able to help ourselves, the kids in our lives, the others in our lives, connect with that food from the moment that we plant the seed, 
from what we're collecting. It's a really great way to connect with that mental health benefits. Plus, I think it's healthier. I think anything that we kind of put a little blood, sweat, and tears into cultivating really makes goes far. Um, nature journaling, nature poetry, um, we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, but those are really great ways of helping ourselves and the kids in our lives and the adults in our lives to connect with nature. A lot of times I'll have kids um, and adults go outside and do some nature journaling, um, draw a picture. Um, I teach them a lot of different easy poetry things, and we'll sh I'll show you one of them in a minute, but if you ever look up um, haiku, diamante, sinquin, there's a lot of structured poems that you can do really great with nature, whether it's doing it outside with something you see or whether it is something that you can, like an object you can bring, you know, like a shell or something like that. Um, finally, I find volunteering in nature, doing projects in nature and learning more about nature actually can inspire kids and adults to be even more connected. And I think that's one of the great benefits of mental health. So uh, I'll give you an example. A, a client of mine was going through some pretty severe depression and anxiety, and she just could not, I mean, she ended up going on FMLA, which is um, Federal, uh, Family Medical Leave Act time, and she couldn't go to work, and she was just stuck on a couch for a long time, and so one of the things we got her to agree to do was to get one plant and to take care of it every day and to go for a walk to walk her dog, and it's really cool because after a while she walked the dog and she found a little pond and in the pond there was a turtle and and she started looking at all the turtles and the dog got excited so she had to stay there well i gotta say fast forward a month later that dog turned into three dogs the uh <laughs> plant turned into quite a few plants and now she's studying permaculture She's back at work. She's doing awesome. She's traveling the world and making a difference. And one of the cool things about it is she's actually created a plan and she just bought a big piece of property to create a nature retreat for the people in her life and to help kids with disabilities to be able to help them connect with animals. And it's an animal rescue. All of this came from a woman who felt really burnt out with her corporate job and had no idea. And I'd ask her, what are your hobbies? Nothing, work. What are the things you love? Work. But getting into nature really helped her connect. And the more she educated herself, she started sharing the benefits of nature. So now she's got all of her friends <laughs> on the same nature routine. She's like, I do just exactly like you do, Dr. Gonzalez. We start with the plant and a walk, and then we take it from there. So there's so many ways to connect with nature. Um, so one of the things I really wanted to talk about was mindfulness. And the cool thing about nature is it's really hard to be in nature and not be mindful, even if it's bad nature, right? And, and I hate to say bad, you know, like what's bad nature and what's good nature, but like when we had a big hurricane, um, you couldn't help but be present to your senses during the hurricane, right? Um, think about going outside. Um, you um, typically, we're going to see things, we're going to hear things, and it's really beneficial. So mindfulness is really important. It's all about paying attention to what we sense with our senses, as opposed to what we think about what we're saying. Um, so there is, yep, Carla, uh, absolutely. There can be dangerous nature, uh, all kinds of things. So with mindfulness, I, I wanna kind of give you the example of the difference between playing soccer on the field. Think about a kid who's like running and they're looking around, where do I pass the ball? And I'm kicking it over there versus sitting on the stands and like, ah, they should run faster, right? They need to do this better. Oh, that person's not doing their job right. When we're mindful, we get off that bench and we're playing and living life. That's when we are present to what we're experiencing with our senses. We get present to that fascination that was mentioned before. 
And we're able to connect with what's around us without getting lost in the, oh my goodness, did I pay this bill? Oh, why is my mother always complaining about me? Why is my daughter always complaining about me? Whatever you say. One of the cool things is that mindfulness can be practiced anywhere we are, but it's especially easy to do it in nature. Um, I lived for a long time out in Asia, and I absolutely love the approach that um, many Asian cultures take with nature. Um, just to give you an example, um, in Hong Kong, in the middle of the most expensive real estate in the world, there's this huge shopping mall, and they have a 650-year-old tree that they hold together with a shopping mall all the way around it, right? So Lao Tzu, a very well-known Chinese philosopher and the founder of Taoism, said nature does not hurry, yet everything is accomplished. That is a really mindful statement. Most of us don't live our lives like that, though. I got to tell you, on a good day, even today, I was doing therapy, 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 garden, 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 therapy, 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 garden. Oh, I've got a webinar in 30 minutes. So most of us are hurrying around, but uh, mindfulness really gives us the opportunity to be able to be taking that moment away. So one of the best ways to be mindful is to engage your five senses. And again, these are some pictures that I took from North Fort Myers Beach. And again, that place right now is still pretty devastated. But when we're being mindful, the best way to get there is to just kind of focus on what do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? What do you smell? And what do you touch? What can you touch? So a really classic mindfulness technique is we call it the five, four, three, two, one technique. And um, I've used this for people to teach them how to ground themselves. So if you think about uh, maybe someone who has an anger management problem or anxiety, you know, you kind of look at this thermometer and if down here is zero, I have zero anger or zero anxiety. And up here I have 10 and I'm going to blow my top, right? Being mindful if you're about five or six on that scale is a really great way to kind of lower it down and just slow down that roll. So oftentimes I'll ask people to do the five senses technique and you know, the standard one that you'll see it all over social media, but it's five things you can see, four things that you can hear, three things that you can smell. Oh, sorry, three things that you can touch, two things that you can smell, and one thing you can taste. And that's the standard way. I'm going to tell you the secret. It really doesn't matter how many of those things you do. Getting mindful is just all about looking at those things. So you can imagine looking at these pictures that if we were at the beach right now, we might see a lot of different things. We All of our senses are gonna be engaged. And you guys have got the chat feature on. So Lee, could you guys tell me what would be some of the things you might see at that beach? Shells, palm fronds, yep, absolutely. Children being buried in the sand, birds, water, absolutely, great. So, so absolutely, we're gonna see um, a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of things to see, you know, you can see this picture, you can see the sunrise, uh, the sunset, I guess that is. You can see shells, um, that particular day, I found these really uh, colors, absolutely. Um, I found these really cool little crabs that were like burying themselves under the sand and stuff like that. Um, anywhere we go in nature, it could be your backyard, it could be, even if you live, like, so I've got clients who live in apartments and they have just this little balcony and I'll have them just go out and sit outside and take a fresh air break. And I'm like, okay, so what do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? What do you smell? What do you touch? 
So at the beach, what would be some things that we might hear? Waves, birds, laughter, yeah. Wind, oh, definitely. I gotta say, going to the beach or any place where there's like a sandy place by water is one of my favorite places for mindfulness, right? Um, voices, laughter, absolutely. What might be some things you could smell at the beach? Fish. Yep. Unfortunately, here in Southwest, um, salt where we are, but not at Lake Michigan. True. Um, I will say, unfortunately, where we live, sometimes we smell red tide, unfortunately, you know, but yeah, there's a lot of things you can smell. And a lot of times just the water, um, the air around any big body of water, whether there's salt or not, you can just feel, you could smell that humidity. Um, so anyway, you can do this kind of exercise with anything that you, um, any place in nature. It's a great one for kids. My clients love doing this. I've actually stopped a few people in the middle of a panic attack. I mean, I wouldn't recommend usually waiting till the anger explode or the panic attack or whatever that is. I really kind of recommend using this technique when you're like five or six, but it's a great one. And I love teaching it to little kids. Um, as you know, you can start off with just, you know, what's one thing you see? What's one thing you hear? It's a great way to get people present. It's also a great way to get us for present. This is also really good for people who have experienced trauma. You know, one of the things that we know about trauma is that you can experience the trauma triggering and the fight or flight when you're in a relaxed body state. And so mindfulness Using our senses is like a doorway that gets us out of that heightened awareness and the <laughs> panic of the trauma and back into our senses. So another thing we might do with mindfulness, um, if you were inside, you might say, have somebody look at um, classic one is like, okay, name all the things that you see that are the color blue, right? Um, it's a really effective way. It gets people distracted. One of the things I get my clients into, and they just all laugh at me because now they're looking for flowers and they're looking for birds. To me, those two things are the best in the world to be mindful. If you're outside watching birds, you're like, oh, here's a cardinal. Oh, here's a blue jay. Oh, here's a hawk. You know, like you're looking all over the place. It actually takes your brain out of all the stress that you've been experiencing, all of the anxiety, all of the depression, and it gets you to focus your attention and it creates that fascination. Um, my son, Danny, who's on this call, gave me the best Mother's Day present in the world. It is a bird feeder that has a camera on it. And I actually have it out here so I can see um, through the window the birds that go visit it. But then I get all these pictures of it. And it's been fun. He gets involved with it. And we learn all about the animals and the names of the different species and things like that. But the fun part also is to really just be able to look. Oh, there's there's another cardinal. Oh, there's this. And so looking for those those things that we see is really good. Flowers are another great way. Um, the other thing you can do is with leaves, like you guys up north, you guys have um, actual seasons. So you can look at like colors of leaves and things like that. So, um, so that's, oops, I did not mean to email myself. Let's not do that. So anyway, um, I mentioned different kinds of poems. And so this is a kind of poem that I love doing with kids. And so usually when they do it, I'll have them either bring the iPad or the phone that they're using for their therapy session outside and we'll do this poem or we'll do it with a, um, a piece of, of nature that they bring in. And um, so really it's a, a poem that you use with sensory words. And the first one's a title. And then you use two words that are a smell or a taste three words that are something you can touch, four words that are sight, and five words that are sound. 
And there's a lot of different kinds of poems like this. You know, you can do haiku, which are like five syllables and then seven syllables and then five syllables. You can do a diamante or a cinquain where you do a word, two words, two adjectives that describe it, three I and G words, et cetera. I do a lot of that kind of poetry. And um, even when I do ecotherapy groups and we're, we'll be all sitting out in, um, in the grass and I love sitting in grass, feeling all of that stuff, except for my yard because we have fire ants. So we don't sit in the grass. We got to sit on something else. But what I find is that people get scared about creating poems. But when it just comes to making some words, it almost becomes like making a Mad Libs. And one of the coolest things is this really promotes that fascination, which helps increase our self-esteem, our self-confidence, and it helps us focus the attention. So this is a great kind of exercise that you can do um, with kids. It's one you can do yourself. Um, I once took a course in Japanese psychology and one of the assignments we had to do is every day for 30 days when we woke up, we had to write a haiku about the first thing we saw. So after a while, I got tired of writing about my pillow. So I made sure that I to open the drapes and I could look outside and see something beautiful when I wrote my poem. So in this case, you've got trees, fragrant flowers, hard scratchy bark, tall, thin, many branches, soft rustling in the breeze. So sometimes when my clients, uh, here's that, that Chinese silk wash tree I was mentioning. And actually, if you can see, that's the really cool bumpy parts of that tree, tree, um, the tree bark, which I really loved. Um, you, could, you could make a poem like this with kids. You can take it, use a tree. You could use anything that you can think of. Um, I enjoy doing it when my kids don't bring something or the adults I'm working with don't bring something or they're not, can't be outside. I'll pop a couple pictures from my place and then we can just kind of do something like that. And that's one of the neat things about nature is that we can actually use, we actually can get a lot of the benefits from nature. Not all of them, of course, but we can get a lot of the visual benefits of nature from seeing pictures and from hearing nature sounds. Um, and here's some of the pictures um, of my backyard. And this is where I go. It does not quite look like this right now because we had a big old uh, hurricane last year. So we are rebuilding a lot of this, but um, this is kind of where I like to go. And it's like my happy place. Um, you can imagine just how many sounds you're gonna hear between the birds and the things you can see, et cetera. I'm gonna stop. I do have some other slides we can talk about, but I wanted to see if anybody had any questions about anything that I've talked about so far. Thanks, Absolutely, Carla. Yeah, Go ahead. people are welcome to put uh, questions in the chat and or unmute and or put yourself on video and ask questions as well. Either way would work great. Awesome. And, and, you know, just in, in response to what you said, Carla, it's great to have our own special places nearby to visit. That's something that I like to do with my clients, regardless of the age, um, whether they're kids, whether they're adults. I like them to go into a place uh, of nature and do that five senses technique and do a little journaling sometimes, maybe bring like a little twig or something that reminds them of that. But then we will do in therapy, oftentimes we'll do meditations with that particular place so that anytime they feel anxious, they know they can go underneath the mango tree or they know that they can go um, into the woods or they know that they can go to the beach. And we find that just even thinking about that place can put us into a mindful state even without actually being. So even if you're stuck in a cubicle or, you know, somewhere that's, that, it, that feels like it's void of nature, you can bring that up. And the more people bring that special place that they visit, the easier it is to bring that, that memory. So any okay. questions? That's really neat. I like that. Um, I do wonder, uh, like, it looks like you have a beautiful backyard. I have yet to see it, but I also know that you live in a neighborhood. So there are houses and such around you. Um, yes. And, but you've purposely chosen a place uh, where you are and such. 
Um, some people live in more urban areas or maybe in an apartment or something of the sort. And it may be harder to just have nature right there um, where they live. Uh, what suggestions do you have for people in settings like that? Excellent question. You know, um, again, that's a really great place for us to be able to first off remember that even seeing images of nature can be, at least on the part of the visual, can be very healing for us. And we can use nature sounds. If you go to YouTube, I mean, you can you can pay for apps like Calm and Headspace and things like that. And those are great. They have all kinds of nature sounds. But I go to YouTube and I really like it. Those can be really helpful. I will say I was using rain sounds to help me sleep, but then when I moved back to Florida, I forgot that it rains every single day and I found myself falling asleep every afternoon <laughs> because I trained myself to fall asleep to the rain. Um, another thing to do is to think about like if you're in an urban environment, and I know this looks like I like live out in the country, but really like there's houses everywhere and I'm like half a mile from the grocery store and there's like, um, it's a very suburban subdivision. But a lot of people, uh, even if you're living in a balcony, you can have plants. You can bring things that you find along the way um, of nature that remind you of nature. You can sit on your balcony. I have a client right now who's struggling, who's been struggling with a lot of issues with, she has ADHD, depression and anxiety. And she lives in an apartment in the middle of a really big city. And, you know, one thing she does is she likes to go to parks. And so we helped her come up with some routines for her to do and some journaling prompts that she can do in parks. She likes to go outside to her balcony and she actually started planting seeds. And she thought I was, she's like, she thought I was whacked when I was doing it. She goes, none of my therapists tell me to plant seeds. Well, she now has a strawberry garden on her balcony and she loves it because she goes out and eats it and then she shares a little strawberries. I think she added some more vegetables the other day she was telling me about. So we can still plant things in balconies. We can have plants inside of our house. We can find shells, we can find rocks. I, um, you guys aren't at my house, but I have rocks everywhere to the fact that, you know, my son complains a lot about my rocks. Um, but that's really that's a really great place. There's also a lot of books that we can we can read, and this is a really good book that I would recommend. Um, I don't know if you can see it um, here, but it's called Natural Meditation um, by Barbara Ann Kipfer, and I love it because it has all kinds of like little tidbits of things that you can do, both being in nature but also bringing nature to you. Um, Equally, you know, if you are living in an urban place, you know, making sure you have those little field trips to go to the park. I've been so impressed with state parks around the country, um, national parks, county parks, being able to make sure that we and the kids in our lives, whether they're seven or 70, um, you know, that we're able to touch, see, smell things. Um, I forgot one of the things I was going to talk about was like grounding, you know, when we feel anxious and stressed out, sometimes being grounded can be hard to do, you know, just settling. Um, a lot of my kids, especially with anxiety, I'll have them find, and not this size, but I'll find, have them find a rock outside and I'll have them hold on to it whenever they need to feel like they're going to ground um, or maybe it's a stick. Um, but those are some some of the ways that I would recommend. There's a lot of really cool ways to bring nature to you, no matter how much space you might have in an urban setting. I've seen any other questions. I've seen that technique you mentioned with um, the rock and such um, at a climate summit recently as well. Hmm. And so it was for teenagers and young adults, and they each found a rock to carry with them in that journey um, to help deal with some of the climate anxiety. And then they could put all of that together um, and, and release some of that as they found additional solutions to uh, climate change and such as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks for sharing all these great techniques and such to help us with this. That is an excellent thing. And I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, that's actually something I use with people who are going through grief and loss. And you know, grief and loss is something I also specialize in. And it's something I've gone through myself personally. And 
You know, one of the things we often think about when we have anxiety or stress or when we are dealing with a loss, and it could be loss of nature even, you know, it could be loss of a job, of an identity, it could be a loss of a loved one, it could be loss of a relationship, but oftentimes we feel, we can feel in the moment like things are never going to end, and so um, oftentimes we'll talk about like carrying that rock or something like that with us, and then knowing we can put it down, and we can take a break from the grief, we can take a break from the stress, we can put that down. I have a client who I was talking about that too. She's actually created herself. Sorry, I'm going to get a little bit emotional about this. She was grieving the loss of her sister and she started picking up a rock and she'd walk around her neighbor, her, her backyard in her neighborhood and she'd sit it down on the, um, uh, on the, a piece of ground on her backyard. After a while, she actually made a little rock wall of every time she would go for a walk and pick up her grief and then she'd sit it down. And so she'd go for a walk, find a rock, pick it up, walk around with her grief, feel it, feel all the feels, and then she'd sit it down and she made it like a little wall. So it's a great technique and you can do it for a lot of different things. I find it really to be not only good for kids and adolescents, but it's great for us as adults because we do not like to let go of things sometimes. So being able to um, being able to pick something up and know we can let it go and we can always come back and pick it up if we want to again is a great is a great thing for us to know. Thank you very much. Uh, any additional questions? You shared one book that you liked. Um, are there other books or, or resources in general that have been helpful for you in this journey? Absolutely. I'm going to switch this slide. Um, here's a few of them. I Okay, so um, my son rolls his eyes at me uh, on a regular basis, but I collect books and rocks, which is really not conducive to the kind of life I've lived because I have worked and lived in many different countries <laughs> and books and rocks are really uh, heavy. Um, here's a few books that I've enjoyed. Um, uh, I, I put in so many more on the bottom because I didn't want to make like 10 different um, books. Like Carla mentioned, um, Vitamin N, which is a great book and it's like a, a, um, a, a sequel to uh, Last Child in the Woods. Um, there's a lot of books that I would recommend. Um, I really think that it's important to um, learn them a lot. Um, one thing for people who are in those urban settings, you know, even finding books with pictures of nature, those can be really great and, and they have a, a definite place. Thanks. Ah, okay, you put that in the, the slide. Thank you, Marcia. I, I love um, just the even though I live in a very nature rich area and work at a very nature uh, focused space, uh, almost 1200 acres of, uh, you know, wetlands and forests and all kinds of things. Um, I still find that beautiful pictures of nature are awe inspiring. Um, so thanks for reminding us of that. And um, even just photographs of nature. I uh, stopped at a uh, let's see the Lewis and Clark Trail in Nebraska. Um, last week I was um, traveling for a conference and there is just uh, an art exhibit of photographs under the water and the different wow. animals that were in the, the streams and, and lakes and ponds and such. And just the, the photography was beautiful. The details that were on like the snapping turtle and the crawfish and all of those things, uh, it, it gives me um, that sense of wonder and awe just by being able to see it through someone else's lens and their composition of the photography and all of those kinds of things. Just um, the details of all of the, uh, I don't even like algae and fuzz that grows on uh, the turtle's back and skin, you know? <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. really exciting. And you know, that's another way to get involved with art and it's, it's like win, win, win. Uh, really helpful for people dealing with trauma, with stress, anxiety, depression, especially with ADHD as well. 
um, doing art related to um, nature, you know, and that's something you can do even if you like, I don't know, live in a windowless house that has no access to nature um, that you might think of, um, you know, drawing pictures, seeing pictures, taking pictures. I love it when you give, you know, cameras to kids and, and let them take pictures of their world. Um, I do that a lot with my clients. I'll be like, okay, bring me five pictures of your week. And then we'll use that to kind of see what they enjoy doing. Um, and, you know, another thing you can do also is, you know, participating in altruism is really important. And for kids in particular, altruism or giving back can be a great way to help them develop critical thinking skills, to develop social connections, and to really kind of develop that self-confidence and that self sense of self. It's also a wonderful preventative for severe anxiety and depression. And, you know, altruism in nature, like you can volunteer to shelter with animals. You could do citizen science projects with like the Indiana Master Naturalists, or if you're in Florida, the Florida Master Naturalists. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of ways to volunteer. And if we can get the kids interested in that at an early age, it becomes win-win because they get the benefits of nature, they get the benefits of volunteering, and they get the benefits of social connection. Yeah. Um, let's see. So this summer, my son took the junior Indiana Master Naturalist class um, down at Mary Lee, where I've started working. And uh, as part of that, they built into that some of their volunteer hours. And so one of his favorite things that he did, he came home and he's like, I smashed moths today. I'm like, what? <laughs> but they were <laughs> fungi moths um, prior, previously known as gypsy moths. Um, and they're an invasive species in this area. And so they were using their uh, destruction skills and tendencies uh, to actually help the earth and the planet. And then um, my oldest older son, he had taken a conservation leadership uh, seminar um, at Mary Lee as well. And for school, he needs to to get some volunteer hours to graduate and such. And so he was able to go back and help um, prepare for um, the upcoming Junior Indiana Master Naturalist group, um, but then also um, be out on the trails and just be extra hands um, with kids. And uh, one of my coworkers, like, he is so good with children and explaining things to, him, to them. And so he got to spend time in nature and, but then also was sharing with other children around him, some of the things that he learned um, in his recent camp. And so I think it was just, uh, you know, I think you said win, 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 win earlier. Yeah. And he also got leadership and wow, what a great place. That's like five wins at least. Right. Yeah. So it's neat to see um, that there are opportunities across the state um, for um, our, our youth and children to be involved in ways like that. And for us as adults as well, I know that I came into this field actually um, through volunteer work and through the Master Nationalists program. Uh, and uh, so that has been very rewarding to me. And I still volunteer. That's what I'm doing here, you know, uh, as part of Indiana Children and Nature Network. And this is one of my volunteer projects that I enjoy working on. And we have opportunities for anyone that wants to help us volunteer. And we appreciate um, you, Dr. Gonzalez, um, volunteering with us tonight as well. So. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Any other questions? Uh, I do have a question. Um, just okay. a chat with some of my uh, online friends. Uh, and, you know, a small group of them, but several of them had have mentioned that their, their children were going through some, uh, well, one of them in particular mentioned their daughter was going through some suicidal ideation. Um, right now. And um, I know that nature can't just like magically fix things um, and need to get um, uh, professional help and such with it. Um, and, but I was surprised that in this small group of women, maybe eight to 10 of us, um, just in the short amount of time when I was at work today, the ones that responded, like three of the women mentioned that their children and, and some of them very young, you know, age eight, um, and younger um, had had also um, dealt with this as well. Um, I think that it was really powerful that they had a place where it was safe to talk about that because it's not just something that you just bring up while you're waiting for your kids at soccer practice. Um, yeah. and, uh, but they they all had different practical advice and such. And so um, obviously, 
um, getting professional help is important. But what other strategies, and, and you may repeat professional help again, but what strategies would you suggest um, in situations like this? So suicidal ideations, you definitely want to get the person evaluated, probably both by a medical doctor and by a therapist, you know, could be like the primary care doctor or a psychiatrist. But in terms of like nature practices, one of the things I've found, and you know, I actually, I didn't even mentioned that I used to be in charge of suicide prevention for the Marine Corps worldwide. And I was part of the joint task force for all those branches of service for suicide prevention. And when we look at suicide, one of the, the biggest factors is belongingness and a sense of burdensomeness and a fear of death. And, you know, one of the places where we can really use nature to help kids and adults, especially after this pandemic that just kind of really upped the sense of people feeling disconnected is to increase connection. And so like, you know, having a plant to take care of, an animal that's gonna that, that's gonna miss them or, you know, something, an animal that needs them to take care of them. That's like my client that I told you about that was taking the walks with the turtles. She was very suicidal. And for her, having these plants and these animals that relied on her was something really important. She was like, if, if I'm gone, who's gonna take care of these things? And now she's she's been able to get through it. I find that most people who are suicidal, it tends to be kind of a temporary thing. Sometimes they need some definite medication. Sometimes they might need hospitalization. But in addition to that, the more we can help them connect with other people, with a mission, with something that's interesting for them, and we can give them a safe space to talk about it. Sometimes we get so scared about people talking about suicide that we're like, oh, don't, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. And then they feel like they can't talk to anybody about it. So giving them that, that free space to talk about it and helping them build those connections. And then the other part of that is the burdensomeness. Um, typically people who are suicidal are going to feel disconnected and they're going to feel like they're a burden to the world. So if we can give them something that can help them feel good. So even like a kid, something that gives them self-confidence like you're going to help me you can help me volunteer with this that that's going to help them give them like a job and something a purpose right um you know obviously we want, we want it to come from them as much as possible but those are some those are some of the ways we would do it you know just being able to to talk to them um and let them freely talk about it is great uh nature journaling is really cool uh, I've got a, a nine-year-old client right now who alternates between suicidal ideations from sometimes. And so she does a lot of nature journaling. And sometimes when she's really feeling suicidal and she, um, we've talked about it. And for her, it's really like wanting to escape her life. So she gets to pick an animal and she gets to be that animal in her mind. So she's going to escape. She's going to escape like a, a an eagle. And she'll tell me all about what the life is like when she's an eagle and she'll um, escape like a turtle. And now she's going to be a turtle. And it's been a fun, playful way, but it's also caused her to actually, her parents to like, stop making me, us buy her more books on animals because now she <laughs> wants to learn about all the animals. And she has a new way of exercising creativity in a way that keeps her connected to all of these animals. And now she's going outside more and she's leaving her room and she's doing those things that are going to help her stay connected and feel like she's less of a burden and help keep her alive. So definitely we want to get those, those individuals who are suicidal, um, mental health care and medical care when needed. And there's a lot of things we can do to, to prevent suicide. I honestly believe if we can, I, Pentagon didn't agree with me, but I thought if we could just have healing gardens on every military base. I'm like, this would be a really great place. And they're like, no, how about writing a new PowerPoint? But really it's creating a, a, that connection to nature. <laughs> and, and creating those spaces where we can be intentional around them and such. Um, yeah. Um, Stephanie just wrote in the chat, a fun project to, is to take a journey buddy. It can be a, any tiny object and take pictures of it in nature. It makes you look for fun nature photo ops. And then that's something that you can that. share too. And I know that like um, people talk about social media and, and how bad it is sometimes, but at the same time, I fill my feed with um, 
friends who take pictures of flowers and birds and plants and all of those different things. And I really enjoy seeing all of those interesting adventures that they've been on. And Stephanie, like you mentioned, um, we have some friends right now um, whose daughter um, is gone doing some service for a year and a half and they take pictures um, of a little rubber ducky on all of their adventures right now in, in place of their daughter. And um, she's missing out on some fun things, but she's doing some other really cool things too. Um, and I just did want to mention too that the that belongingness that you mentioned and a sense of purpose. Um, I have found uh, that there are different um, groups that facilitate getting outside in nature. Um, I found um, locally in Goshen, Indiana, in the northern part of the state, um, that there's a wild church um, that I can go to like twice a month. Uh, in the afternoon, it doesn't take place of additional church to, for me, um, but it's a time where I can connect and slow down intentionally. And I would mean to do some of these things, um, but if it's not on the calendar, I won't necessarily do it. Um, so it just gives me that venue. And then also there's a group called Hiker Babes. And I believe that this is lots of different places and you can find Wild Church in other places as well. There is a website with um, opportunities for that. Um, but Hiker Babes, um, there are ambassadors, volunteers um, through that organization that set up hikes um, for women um, throughout, for me, you know, Northern Indiana into um, Southern Michigan. And when I've got time, I can go meet up with other people that are going on a hike and uh, not be alone in it kind of thing. And, and even volunteering in some of those capacities uh, can give us that sense of belonging and purposefulness as well. So uh, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, any My final pleasure. words? Uh, well, I was just gonna add to your list um, in many states, I don't know if they have it in Indiana, there's a program called Becoming an Outdoor Woman. Oh, yeah. And yeah, it teaches it. a lot of like ancestral skills and different kinds of things. But what I love about it is it's um, oriented towards um, helping people learn more skills about being in nature and things like that. Um, here in Florida, they changed the program. So now it's for people who just feel insecure, whether they're kids or adults or something like that. And entire families can do it now. So that's kind of a fun thing. Um, but yeah, and, you know, I just really encourage everybody, you know, go out in nature. I put my uh, email down here uh set your soul on fire at gmail.com if anybody has any any questions oh gosh i started thinking spanish um if anybody has any questions feel free to email me i've got lots of different um ideas and things like that for specific situations and stuff like that but i really wanted to make this kind of like a fun overview yeah thank you so much i appreciate it uh awesome. and um thanks for everyone for being 